Welcome to week two. We're going to be going over blood, lymphatic, and immune system. Let's get started. Is there anything more life-giving than blood? Even without any knowledge about anatomy or why something works or homeostasis, with none of that knowledge, you'll still know that if something loses blood, it dies. Blood is life. But it wasn't until recently that we actually knew why blood was so important. The functions of blood include transporting substances like oxygen, regulating homeostasis, for example, cooling us off if we get too hot, protecting us with immune cells called leukocytes, and also having clotting factors so that if we get a cut, we don't just bleed forever, we stop. This picture shows us red blood cells and white blood cells traveling through a blood vessel. But it's very magnified. If we were to look at our blood, it would just look like red liquid. So how do we get that view of our blood? To do that, we have to perform a blood smear. First, you'll take a small sample of someone's blood, pour a drop of it on a slide, spread it out, apply a stain, and allow it to dry. Once dry, you look at it under the microscope. This picture is of a light microscope at 640 times magnification. On here, we're able to see these round, pink shapes, those are all red blood cells. The purple ones are white blood cells. Do you know why they're purple and so much darker than the red blood cells? You may have heard it before. When that stain was applied, this one right here, the stain is absorbed into the DNA of a nucleus, much more so than just in a cell. And so it sticks to it. Now we have large nucleus, a lot of granules in our white blood cells. So all of those stain very darkly. On the other hand, our red blood cells have lost their nucleus. Because of that, there's not much inside of it to absorb that stain. So they're gonna be a lighter color than our white blood cells. So even though they're purple, <laughs> there are white blood cells. You can also see very small pieces called platelets. And these fragments we'll talk about later, they're to aid us with our clotting. Let's take a look at some of the characteristics of blood. The volume of blood that you have in your body is approximately five liters. Your pH in your blood should be around 7.4. This is slightly basic, and we're gonna possibly range between 7.35 to 7.45, but we're trying to stay in that sweet spot. So part of homeostasis is going to be maintaining that pH right in the sweet spot. Now the color of our blood it's going to be bright red when it's oxygenated and dark red when that oxygen level is falling. Viscosity, or the thickness of the blood, is around four to five times thicker than water. Your plasma concentration is going to be a measure of how much solutes you have inside of your blood plasma. Now this has to do with IV bags and osmosis and some of that that we learned about in AMP1. The temperature of your blood is going to be around one degree Celsius higher than your body temperature. On this list, there's only two of these that are in bold, volume and blood pH. Those are your two possible exam questions. I won't examine you over the viscosity or the plasma concentration on those. Back in AMP1, we learned about the different types of tissues, but it's been a while, so let's do a quick recap. Tissues are a group of cells that perform a common function. Major types that we saw were epithelial, connective, 
muscle, and nervous. With these four, which one is blood? Do, 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 do. We're looking at connective tissue. That's going to be your blood. To review, all connective tissue comes from the mesenchyme. That's a tissue when you're in your embryo stage that begins to develop and differentiate into the different types. It could become adipose tissue or fat tissue, collagen, it could be cartilage, could even be bone. But we're looking at the branch that became fluid connective tissue, our blood. So if anyone asks you what type of tissue blood is, it's fluid connective tissue. Now it's called that because it's going to have formed elements, AKA cells, that are going to float in a liquid ground substance, which is plasma for our blood. When we look at blood, all we see is a thicker red liquid. It doesn't tell you anything about how much plasma there is or how many red blood cells there are. To determine that, our individual blood components, we have to take a sample of blood, process it, until we're able to see in a vial such as this, the different components of blood separated. Here we see plasma, a small layer of white blood cells and platelets, and red blood cells. The percentages that we want to see in your average human is going to be 55% plasma, 1% white blood cells and platelets, and 44% red blood cells. How do we determine these components? First, you take a sample of whole blood and place it in a small glass centrifuge tube. This goes in a centrifuge, which spins it. We're going to pull all of the heaviest formed elements to the, down to the bottom of the tube. When this occurs, the plasma, which is 92% water, and has some small proteins in it, and has gases, all of that at the top of the tube, forming the top 55% on your average human. 1% is that small layer of white blood cells and platelets. And 44% is your heaviest formed element in the blood, the red blood cells. This is called a hematocrit. It's the percentage of formed elements within the blood. So now you know the percentage of blood components for your patient. How does that help you? If there are too few red blood cells, say we're down to 30% red blood cells, we could be looking at someone who is anemic. They may have a vitamin or a mineral deficiency stopping them from producing enough red blood cells. On the other hand, if there's less plasma, say we're down to 40% going down on the plasma numbers, that could mean that we're dehydrated, that our body does not have enough water in our blood vessels. Differences in those blood component percentages can indicate a problem that needs to be treated. That brings us to the formed elements themselves. First off, we have erythrocytes. These are red blood cells. Then we have leukocytes, white blood cells, and thrombocytes, platelets. This picture shows us red blood cells and white blood cells traveling through a blood vessel. The first formed element we're going to look at is the red blood cell, the donkey of the body. The reason why I call red blood cells your donkeys is because all they do their entire life is they carry around oxygen. That's it. After around 120 days, they die. They've completed their job. So if you can imagine, 
right now you have all of these small little cells going through your body pumped by the cardiovascular system all they do is carry oxygen for 120 days and then they die and they're replaced those are your donkeys inside of each red blood cell we have millions of tiny proteins called hemoglobins now a hemoglobin is a lot like one of these jugs on the donkey's pack. It's carrying inside of it the gases. Your red blood cells function by transporting oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. They're using that small hemoglobin protein to do both of these things. In your red blood cell, we have around 270 million hemoglobin proteins, so it is just packed full of them. This is a picture of a single hemoglobin protein. Now, a hemoglobin is kind of interesting because it's actually a combination of different alpha and beta polypeptide chains. So different chains of proteins come together to form one large hemoglobin. Inside of a hemoglobin, you're going to find four heme groups, groups that surround a single molecule of iron. This allows for oxygen to attach to the heme group. So a single hemoglobin can carry one, two, three, four oxygen and there's 270 million of these hemoglobins. So you can imagine the amount of oxygen molecules that can be carried by a single red blood cell. Where does carbon dioxide attach? To the chains of hemoglobin itself. It doesn't attach to the iron like the oxygen does. Now, why is that important? Why do we not want our carbon dioxide binding to our heme group? Because the heme group carries oxygen, if we instead bound our carbon dioxide to it, it would actually block the heme group and not allow oxygen. So your red blood cells would be going through your body just carrying around waste and your cells would not get oxygen. Luckily, <laughs> of our cells don't do that. Only that oxygen binds to the heme group. But there is a different molecule that does compete with oxygen, carbon monoxide. Have you heard of carbon monoxide poisoning? If you inhale carbon monoxide, it binds to the heme group. It competes with the oxygen molecule looking for that iron. When the carbon monoxide binds, it blocks it from the oxygen. So your red blood cells begin to circulate with more and more carbon monoxide and less and less oxygen. This is called the silent killer because you begin to get sleepy and eventually pass out as without enough oxygen, your body can't continue working with its brain and its cells. You have a very oxygen hungry brain. Let's leave behind silent killers and go on to more characteristics of that red blood cell. Here we have the shape of a red blood cell. If you notice, the red blood cell doesn't have a round shape. It almost looks like you took a circle, squeezed the middle of it to almost form a donut, but left a membrane there in the middle. This shape is called a biconcave disc. So it's a disc with a concave or curved inward shape on both sides, not just one. So one concave and two concave. The reason why we see this shape instead of just a perfectly round cell is because it increases the surface area for diffusion of that oxygen. Imagine if your cell was round. How would the hemoglobins in the very center of the cell be exposed to oxygen 
in the capillaries around them. That area would, would be very limited in the oxygen it would come in contact with through diffusion. So surface area increases when the majority of our hemoglobins are very close to the cell surface. It also helps because it can squeeze through those small capillaries better than they would if they were all perfectly spherical. Shape-wise, it's kind of shaped like a flotation device, but you put a membrane across the middle, so it's thinner in the middle than it is on the outer ring. There is no nucleus inside of the red blood cell because it doesn't need one. When they're formed, that nucleus is actually removed to allow for more hemoglobins, and because the, it's just a donkey, doesn't need to divide, it doesn't need to multiply like a lot of our tissue cells do, epithelium for example. Instead, it's going to be formed, float through the blood, and then eventually decompose. Any idea how much blood you're safely allowed to donate? A mere two cups, that's it. 8 to 10% of your total blood volume is safe to donate, normally causing no symptoms, possibly feeling faint. That's not very much blood. If we were to lose 15 to 30% of your blood, you're going to start going into shock, feeling weak, looking pale, Part of the reason being that your body's actually trying to compress all of your blood, keeping it in your brain and your abdomen. So we lose the capillary blood going to our skin. That gives us a pretty flushed pink appearance. As you go into shock, if you continue to lose blood, say you get 30 to 40% blood loss, you need an immediate transfusion. Your blood pressure is dropping dangerously low. Above 40%, your blood pressure drops so low that your circulation stops, your organs begin to fail as they are not getting blood, your brain is going to go into a coma to try to slow down its oxygen and usage as much as possible to keep you alive, but if the blood loss continues, it leads to death. So percentage-wise, you're not going to be able to survive on 50% you need really 90% of that five liters of blood. Red blood cells are being formed as we speak inside of your red bone marrow. They are going to mature, lose their nucleus, go and travel throughout the blood circulatory system through the blood vessels, performing their functions, transporting gases, being nourished by the glucose in the blood surrounding them. They'll live for around 120 days. Once they start getting older, their membrane becomes a little more decrepit, the body's going to recycle them in the liver and the spleen to use their components to make more red blood cells. That iron, for example, we want to retain that and use it in the forming of new ones versus just letting it leave. The formation of blood components is known as hematopoiesis. It occurs in your red bone marrow where red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are all being formed. Every day, you're going to replace around 1% of your red blood cells. To produce red blood cells, our body needs a good supply of folic acid, vitamin B12, and iron. When there is a lack of one of these components, the overall production of red blood cells begins to fall and we're not able to replace them like we need to. This can cause anemia, where we have too few of our red blood cells. With this in mind, let's look at a way the body can increase the production of red blood cells if they start to fall too low. It's a hormone called EPO, erythropoietin. This hormone 
is going to increase our production of red blood cells. And you may have heard about it before, linked to Lance Armstrong. He actually took this hormone as a way to increase his red blood cell production before a race. Why? What do you think the reason is that he would do that? You may have guessed or have heard that having more red blood cells, increasing that production allows you to have more oxygen being carried in your blood and fueling more of your muscles so you can go faster and keep going at a higher speed for longer. Let's see how that works. Here we have a stimulus. Our blood oxygen levels are going down. There could be several reasons for that, but if we don't have enough red blood cells, that's going to naturally lead to a decreased blood oxygen level. The body does not want that. We need our oxygen, especially the brain. So what will happen is the kidney detects the decreased blood oxygen concentration and it starts to release the hormone EPO into your blood. Once EPO goes in the blood, it's going to travel to our targets, the red bone marrow. It's going to tell the red bone marrow to increase the rate of red blood cell production. As more red blood cells enter circulation, the overall amount of oxygen being carried goes up, leading to a healthy level of oxygen, causing production of further EPO to be inhibited once we're back to a healthy range. If the oxygen levels drop again, the EPO will get produced again. Increase that red blood cell production until the oxygen levels are back to normal. This is a summary page showing us the effects of that EPO. It's stimulated by the blood oxygen level decrease, detected by kidney, kidney releases EPO, which stimulates red bone marrow to increase production of red blood cells, leading to increased blood oxygen levels, and through negative feedback, stopping the kidney from producing further EPO. So for Lance Armstrong, when he took EPO, it continually caused the red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells, which kept increasing the blood oxygen levels. That brings us to the end of the line for the red blood cells. They only lasted 120 days. When it's time for that red blood cell to be retired, it's called phagocytosis. The destruction of blood cells that occurs in the liver and the spleen. The components of our hemoglobin, we want to conserve and recycle those to use again. Except for the heme. The heme is degraded into bilirubin, which is removed from the body using our feces and our urine. It actually gives it the brown and yellow color that you see. That's all degraded old parts of red blood cells. Here we see our liver and our spleen ingesting and destroying those old red blood cells. Hemoglobin is broken down into its two components of globin and heme. Globin are amino acid chains, so we're going to break that down into the individual amino acids and use that to create new proteins. Whereas the heme, we break that down into the iron and the bilirubin. Bilirubin, we remove it, and the iron, we take it back into the red bone marrow and use it to create new hemoglobins. This is a pretty efficient process, so we don't waste our energy resources or our iron, but sometimes when we're trying to get rid of that bilirubin, it doesn't always make it all the way out of the body. And if it starts to build up, we turn yellow. It's called jaundice. Jaundice is going to be the yellowing of skin and eyes caused by a high level of bilirubin being in the body. 
the liver is going to process that bilirubin from the red blood cells and pass it through the intestinal tract to leave the body. If it's unable to make it all the way out, if the liver can't process it properly, it just starts to build up in all of the cells in your body. Newborn babies whose livers might not work properly yet can have a jaundiced appearance, but we can treat that by UV light to help break it down. And as the liver starts working properly, more bilirubin is gonna be filtered out of the body and will return to a normal color. If your patient is an adult who has jaundice, there are several reasons why this could occur. It could be due to liver failure, alcohol, fatty liver, and certain medications. Anytime the liver is not functioning properly, you can see this buildup of bilirubin giving the yellow appearance. These are two newborns, one who does have jaundice and one who does not. So you can really see that yellow color. Phew, all right. That was a lot on red blood cells. Let's move on and look at plasma now. Plasma is the fluid matrix of the blood. The formed elements, really the red blood cells, are what give blood its red color. The plasma itself is more of a yellow color. In your blood vessels, the cells are being pushed along through that liquid plasma, kind of like a life preserver in a pool. It's just the cells are floating in that liquid. Here's a bag of just plasma, so you can see the color. This is with all of the formed elements of red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets removed from blood. Plasma, by volume, is composed of 92% water, 7% plasma proteins, and 1% of other solids. We have a couple of different names for this fluid. It's called serum if it's plasma without the clotting protein, and it's called lymph if it's plasma that was filtered out of the capillaries and then got absorbed into the lymphatic system. How do we filter out those cells to get only plasma? There are machines designed to process whole blood, take out the plasma, and return the red blood cells and white blood cells back to the patient. Now, there was something interesting that was noted when taking these plasma donations. Certain people gave green plasma instead of yellow. At first, they just threw away the green plasma bags thinking something strange happened. But it, once they started looking into it, scientists actually found out that the green plasma kept coming from women who were on birth control. They finally determined that estrogen birth control actually elevated the levels of a copper containing protein when it was in high enough concentrations, it gave the plasma the green color. At 92% water, you would think that the proteins weren't all that important in your plasma. But in fact, they have a very important function, each of them. The proteins that we see commonly include albumin, which helps draw fluid back into the blood, globulin, which aids in transport and forming antibodies, fibrinogen, that aids in blood clot formation, and regulatory proteins like enzymes and hormones. Lastly, plasma contains other solutes, which can be electrolytes like sodium or calcium, nutrients like glucose, amino acids, and lipids, gases, small amounts of free-floating oxygen or carbon dioxide, and also waste products, 
like ammonia and urea that we're going to filter out and remove through our urine. Time to talk about that 1%, our white blood cells, or I guess our purple blood cells. Our white blood cells are called our leukocytes. They are spread throughout the entire body, helping to protect it against diseases and foreign invaders. We'll learn a lot more about that when we get to the immune system chapter. They're only 1% of that blood, but there's many different types of white blood cells present in that 1%. Just like we have armed forces, the Marines, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and each one is trained to fight a specific threat, your white blood cells have different types that are best against a certain disease or for an invader like a parasite. If we were attacked by a country over the sea, we would build more naval ships and less tanks. Your body is the same way. White blood cells that are specialized to fight parasites are normally kept to pretty low levels in your body. But if we are attacked by a parasite, it begins to amp up that production. If we are counting your white blood cells, and we know something's wrong, but we don't know what, and we see that really high number of parasite fighting white blood cells, it tells us you're currently being attacked by parasites. So it's a really good diagnostic tool. Our white blood cells can be organized based on if they have granules in their cytoplasm or not. These granules contain enzymes that damage pathogens and mediate or control inflammation. The two groups are thus known as granulocytes or agranulocytes. When these white blood cells are being formed, they actually come from different stem cells. The blood stem cell can turn into either a myeloid stem cell, becoming a red blood cell, a platelet, or a granulocyte. The other alternative is it can become a lymphoid stem cell that becomes a lymphoblast, turning into an agranulocyte white blood cell. Here are pictures of those white blood cells. These are pictures from a blood smear where a stain was applied and the stain was taken up by the granules and the nucleus, but not so much the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm of the cell is going to show up as clear, best seen here with this monocyte. The granules, are shown in dark colors, and the nucleus stains so darkly it's almost just that pure dark purple. On top, we have the three granulocytes that contain granules. The neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. The agranulocytes that lack granules include the lymphocyte, and the monocyte. Each of these white blood cells have their own specific function and target in the body. First, let's look at the neutrophil. The neutrophil is a granulocyte because it has granules, but of the three granulocytes, it has the least, so it just has little specks. It is the most common white blood cell in general, we see around 60% of your white blood cells are neutrophils. The neutrophil is your good general soldier. Anytime you have a wound or there's a chance of bacteria being a threat, we can send the neutrophils there. They can enter your tissue and phagocytize or eat the bacteria. Because of that, 
if you have a wound that has pus in it, there's a good chance that you have a lot of neutrophils in that pus because they're trying to destroy any bacteria present. When we look at a blood smear, to identify a neutrophil, we look for multiple lobes of the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus, because it has so much DNA material in there, is staining very dark. So this has three lobes of its nucleus, kind of separated, two lobes, two, an S-shaped nucleus. This is in general what a neutrophil will look like. Next up, we have the eosinophils. These guys are only present at about 2% of your leukocytes, and these are those parasite attackers that I talked about. So if we have a high amount of eosinophils, you're probably being attacked by parasites, or maybe you have a bad case of allergies. In general, when we're looking at an eosinophil on a slide, we'll see it's almost a pink color. There's a lot of granules in the cytoplasm. Typically, we will often see a horseshoe-shaped nucleus, but it's going to be a bilobed in comparison to the neutrophil, where you could see three. We'll normally see two with our eosinophils and a, a pink color or red. The darkest of our granulocytes is the basophil. The basophil is a 1%. It's one of those least common leukocytes. Does typically have a bilobe, but sometimes it'll look completely round. It's just very dark because of all of those granules in its cytoplasm. Large amounts of histamine and heparin in its granules is what gives it that dark appearance. When it uses those, it can control our inflammation in an area, bringing more plasma and white blood cells into a localized area where an infection is being fought. That wraps up the three granulocytes. On to A granulocytes. 30% of your white blood cells are lymphocytes. They have a dark nucleus, normally round, and takes up the majority of that cell, leaving only a small sliver of clear cytoplasm being visible around it. This is the main defense for your immune system when we want to have a targeted attack. Think of a SWAT team that's given the address to attack a house to look for a specific target versus just sending the army to attack an entire city. These guys are SWAT teams. They produce antibodies that can hunt for a specific foreign invader and they're gonna differentiate into T cells, B cells, and NK cells, which we'll learn about later on. The other type of agranulocyte is a monocyte. A monocyte takes up about 6% of our leukocytes, has a very dark nucleus, but it lacks the perfect round shape we saw in the lymphocyte. Now it maybe can be a horseshoe shape with no granules in its cytoplasm. If the body is under attack, monocytes are one of our first lines of defense as they can become large, aggressive macrophages, able to eat or phagocytize large amounts of bacteria and protect us. Here are the four types shown together. The neutrophil, small granules, three lobes, sometimes two, eosinophil, a pink or red appearance to its granules, two lobes, basophil, so many dark granules that it almost looks like just a dark circle, lymphocyte, round with a little bit of clear cytoplasm showing, and a monocyte, has that bilobe and the clear cytoplasm surrounding it. Here's a little test. Which type of white blood cell is seen here? 
neutrophil. And what about over here? Lymphocyte. This one, that would be a lymphocyte. Let's try it again. What about this one? A monocyte, this one, a neutrophil, and this one, a lymphocyte. What else other than red blood cells and white blood cells is present on this blood smear? Did you notice the little platelets? These tiny little pieces are actually cellular fragments with a membrane. They're called thrombocytes. They function in helping us to form blood clots and also repair blood vessels. They don't last for that 120 days like we saw the red blood cells. They only survive for about 10 days in the blood. Platelets are produced in our red bone marrow through a process called thrombopoiesis. Large cells called megakaryocytes are located around the blood vessels in the red bone marrow, pushing small extensions of their membrane into the blood vessel where pieces break off. These broken off pieces are platelets. We're gonna end the video on this slide, ran out of time, but for your studying, be sure to read the PowerPoint. It does continue past this point. It has more material that could potentially be on our unit two lecture exam. Good luck studying.